Hello, welcome to Gemma Network Open. I'm Seth Kruger, Digital Media Editor at Gemma Network Open. Or sorry, welcome to Gemma Live. I'm uh, Seth Kruger, Digital Media Editor at Gemma Network Open. Uh, of course, if you're following on live, send us your questions or comments on Twitter at Gemma Network Open or on Facebook or YouTube Live in the comment box. Today, we are talking about self-reported CBD use for conditions with proven therapies. And we've got senior author of the study, John Ayers, with us. Welcome, Dr. Ayers. Thank you for having me. We're really glad you could join us. Um, uh, first, can you just uh, introduce yourself, tell us a little about who you are, what you do, and why I did this study here? Uh, well, I'm a, I work in academic medicine. I'm the vice chief of innovation in the Division of Infectious Disease and Global Public Health at UC San Diego Medical School. And really what the stream of all our research we've been doing for nearly a decade now is, is trying to get the public back in public health. Too much of what we do is top down, where we assume that the public needs to come forward and use existing channels to communicate their needs. So instead, what our team does is uses digital media, news media, social media, internet searches, to instead listen to the millions of voices already talking about the needs and priorities of the population so we can then respond to those needs. And when we do that, we can have a tremendous effect. Great. Well, this is an interesting study. Before we get into this, I want to mention the two other papers um, that you're also an author on that uh, you linked to in your tweet for this and we retweeted. One of them is from 2019 in our journal, The Trends in Internet Searches for CBD in the U.S. And as well, there was also last a year ago, May, uh, an, a viewpoint in JAMA, the need for federal regulation in marijuana marketing. So tell us first a little bit about the landscape here and, you know, why is there, you know, before you get into the CBD uh, conditions that we've talked that you're going to talk about in the paper, you know what's been going on with CBD? How widespread is it? How do we get here? Well, I always thought of you know as the marijuana industry, the cannabis industry being kind of niche, until one day I was listening to a very famous radio program, the most listened to radio program in the United States, and I heard an advertisement. And the advertisement never said what product they were selling. It just said that the product cured everything, and you could find out more by going to that retailer's website. And that retailer was MedMen.com. And then I realized in all 50 states, people are getting exposed to advertisements. How do the benefits of cannabis products like CBD, which may be available everywhere, or products that contain THC, you know, traditional marijuana, regardless if it's legal in their state. And so we, we looked at that and we saw that this was not an outlier. Instead, the cannabis industry has been promoting their products using health claims, among some other nefarious uh, methods like promoting to youth, you know, selling high school varsity jackets, for example, or, you know, uh, gingerbread house kits that you can make with the kid that contain THC or CBD. And so we saw that and we thought, well, what's really going on here? And then we, we, we did a follow up to that study. And we saw that these products were insanely popular. And that is more people, for example, with a case of CBD, search for CBD in a typical month on Google than they do for yoga, e-cigarettes, uh, supplements, et cetera. It's like insanely popular. I think it was, you know, 16 or 11 million searches every month. And that was at that time. And it was growing a, nearly a year ago and it's been growing rapidly. So now you can imagine uh, what it's at. And it's a case of, you know, as regulatory scientists, we're slow to move. We're slow to see how the public is changing. And when we start to look at CBD, we could just see some huge changes in both how these products were marketed and how consumers at the same time we're seeking them out in record numbers. And that led us to think, well, how are consumers changing? Yeah. So the paper you're talking about, uh, the figure two shows the different rankings from the from searches on Google in April 2019. You can see, you know, some of the big things at the top, diet and e-cigarettes and yoga. But CBD is ahead of veganism, marijuana, exercise, vaccination. Yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, I don't know. It's certainly yeah. here uh, and, and a big thing that a lot of our patients are using. And that growth and popularity happened simultaneous to very consistent marketing, marketing that claims that CBD or other cannabis products are really a cure-all. And, you know, with that, we saw that when the FDA director was testifying before Congress, you know, the issue of CBD came up tangentially. And, of course, the senator said, well, CBD is a great thing. I don't want to say bad things, but can you tell us what you're going to do about CBD? And, and the answer was, well we would regulate it more strongly if we saw it was potentially harming the public. And what's the way it would harm the public that would catch our attention the most? If they were using it as a real medicine, if they were using it as a supplement or an alternative to traditional prescription medications to treat diagnosable conditions. And when we heard that, we thought we need to respond to that. We don't need to wait years to have the answer. And so what our study in JAMA Network Open does is it answers that, you know, by going 
to where CBD users are already gathered on Reddit or CBD, where near over 100,000 users get together routinely to discuss CBD use and why they use CBD. And we curated that data to identify a subset of posts where people describe that they themselves were an active CBD user. And then we looked to see why they use it. And what we found, 90% of posters say they use CBD to treat a diagnosable medical condition. I'm curious, uh, were you able to tell in the paper or just know from other information, is any of this like AstroTurf or bots or is, or is this all seem to be genuine people using it? This is all genuine people in this okay. case. Uh, you know, we filter the data to identify genuine people and we have methods that we use to remove bots, et cetera. But in this case, it was certainly genuine people and we've relied on self-reports. Not my friend uses it, of course, in these forums. You see a lot, well, my friend or my dad or my boyfriend, they use it for this, this reason. In our case, we want to see. I testify myself why I use it and I, I describe it. And on Reddit, people actually go into great detail. You know, we think of social media as being a little sound bites, you know, particularly us that use Twitter. But on Reddit, people go in great lengths. You know, so in the terms of how people would describe why they use CBD for our study, it was actually like a short report in JAMA, you know, where people were going into detail about the history of using CBD and what they were using CBD for. Right. So speaking of which, uh, you know, the table's got a little uh, too much for us to show here, but table two talks about the different types of conditions that people are using it for. Can you talk about, uh, you know, the big stuff here? Some of it's not terribly surprising, like arthritis or muscle pain, um, even sleep and headaches. But what else are people using it for? Well, what, we really looked at two things. So, you know, one of the things we did when we originally looked at the marketing from the cannabis industry is their claim was, well, we're marketing as a wellness device. So therefore, we're kind of immune to a lot of criticism that regulators may have. Well, so we want to evaluate that. So the first thing we looked at is, were people using it for wellness? And that is saying it just makes them feel better. Or the way that it would describe it is like yoga or a supplement or a, a new diet. And, and what we saw was only about one in four posts or one in five posts even mentioned wellness at all. You know, typically people will think of this CBD as real medicine and they turn to it to treat real diagnosable conditions. And when they do, what we saw that was surprising was simply the diversity in outcomes that people think CBD is real medicine for. They really think, you know, it's a cure-all. You know, it's, I, I've said before, it's this generation snake oil. And across specialties, we start to group and see how people sought out CBD as a therapeutic. And we saw some really surprising things, you know, like cardiology and how many cardiologists, practicing cardiologists, when they're negotiating treatment strategies with their patient, which it is a negotiation, right? I mean, yeah. they, they don't want to necessarily listen or they have their own ideas, even think to bring up CBD. And here we see cases of people saying that they use CBD to treat their AFib when there's no therapeutic claim. And by the way, there's all the examples that we identify, none of which are endorsed by the FDA. Over-the-counter CBD is not proven or identified or FDA approved as a treatment for any of the medical conditions we saw. And that's what's really troubling. And particularly when we know that CBD isn't just the heart, you know, the, it's not like drinking water, right? You know, so we know some problems with the CBD industry and I can go into detail there. Right. Well, and I think something that you talk about a little in the paper, uh, you know, CBD is essentially a supplement. Um, and, you know, what we've seen with other supplements is, you know, I'm going to use the term half loosely, but half the supplements don't have what they say they're supposed to have. And yeah. half of them have other stuff that's physiologically active that they don't say they have. Yeah. Um, and it seems like CBD is pretty similar with that. That's what happens when people when people initially hear about this industry, they go, well, it's just CBD. And, and what does it matter? You know, if people want to give it a try, go ahead and give it a try. Well, I warn people to correct that thinking because first, it's not even clear that they're getting CBD. There was a study in JAMA in 2017 that showed about 70% of products labeled as CBD were mislabeled and that many of these products contained constituents that weren't disclosed, constituents that could be harmful. We've already seen the effects of that. There was a mass poisoning in Utah at a traveling fair where they sold CBD products, particularly this mix at home uh, products. and that resulted in hundreds of people being poisoned from tainted CBD products. So when you buy this, you don't even know what you're getting and you may be getting the bad stuff. And we've also seen that with, you know, the vaping illness outbreak, you know, that was specifically THC cannabis, but that was responsible for the thousands of children that were hospitalized related to vaping. So we see that. And then the third thing is, is like, well, it actually has side effects and has effects on people's health directly that we know about. 
We know about cardiovascular risk to taking CBD. And so we know about sexual health risk, which is really interesting. And we can go into more detail about the types of things. And since you have the paper there, you can talk about it. The types of things we saw were people are actually taking it for issues like erectile dysfunction, even though that is potentially a known adverse event from using CBD. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think another thing that you talk about in the paper that I found really interesting and scary is that, you know, I'm sure I'm using these terms wrong, but, uh, you know, people talk about it. Well, it's okay to use these alternative medicines if you're complementing, uh, you know, mainstream medicine. But what people are really doing is substituting. They're using it instead as just the alternative and not in combination with, you know, prescription medicines from their physicians. Yeah, we definitely saw examples of people substituting the medication. You know, one of the more troubling examples we saw was a cardiology patient who had AFib who substituted uh, CBD for their Coumadin, which, you know, puts them at extreme risk of a thrombosis or stroke and, and sudden death. So, you know, clearly that's not a substitute we would endorse and we're not thinking about it. And, you know, really what happens here is none of this should happen, right? The public should have never been misinformed about by the cannabis industry to think that their products are cure-alls. They should never been out there seeking information on it and finding information on it and, and going out and buying it. And now what are we left with? And so when you look at our study, it's kind of like a whack-a-mole approach. We ask physicians to come forward and recognize the dangers of CBD and talk about CBD with their patients. That's such, such an obtuse way of handling it. And it's sad that we're in that position where that's our best currently available strategy. Well, we have to now go gastroenterologist, cardiologist, endocrinologist. Think about CBD. Talk about it with your patients. You'll be surprised. They're using it. And they're sometimes using it instead of the medications we're prescribing. When we could have other strategies, and I think that's one thing our study does, is it identifies what other strategies should be implemented by specifically calling back to what the FDA director then testified and saying, hey, we got that data you said would motivate you to take action. Now is the time to take action instead of using a whack-a-mole approach. Yep. I mean, again, this is this is every time we talk about supplements, this is something that comes up. But, you know, basically, since the, I think it's the mid 90s, supplements are essentially unregulated as long as they don't they don't make specific health claims. They all you know dance around making very specific health claims. And then it opens up this big regulatory hole that essentially makes it, uh, you know, there's I live in the city. There's CBD shops all around my neighborhood. It's crazy. Yeah, no. And, and that's exactly. And, and so here's a, an, an interesting alternative. So one of the things that that we've done and others have done is, is looked at the marketing materials and been like, well, this isn't kosher, right? Yeah. You know, saying CBD is a substitute or treatment for, hang on one second, I got to mute my phone. <laughs> saying CBD is a treatment or substitute like for substance withdrawals, you know, opioids withdrawals. We've seen claims about that. And what they do is they'll put it on like a blog that's not connected to their site or they'll do research as marketing, which is a very common strategy this industry mm -hmm. uses, where it'll give just a little bit of money, not enough to, to, to go through any FDA therapeutic trials where we have, you know, rigorous design, you know, well, first equipoise, rigorous designs, you know, outside oversight from blinded experts, you know, and then multiple confirming st studies and then post-marketing surveillance. They so just go like, here's a million dollars. Talk about how CBD makes you feel better. And then they use the news. And so one of the interesting things I saw recently thinking of COVID is like if you go online and when we know from our data, there's about a quarter million people every month searching for COVID and CBD, thinking that it could be a potential treatment. And if you execute that search, now a lot of the people watching at home should do this, just search CBD and COVID. And guess what you're going to find? All links saying that CBD cures or prevents COVID. And where do all those links come from? The news. You know, and it's that research is marketing strategy that they use to prioritize their placement of the products in digital media and also get that message out there. And I think the difference here is like, OK, well, they have these loopholes and they do it. Well, now we're directly observing how that marketing has impacted the population. It's not like grandma just suddenly had an epiphany and thought, well, instead of seeing the cardiologist, I'm going to take CBD. You know, they she learned that somewhere. Right. And so clearly now we see the, the, the harm. Now we should take a response and maybe a similar strategy for other supplements that, and I would say other supplements far or less dangerous to population health and individuals, we could use that same strategy for those too. Yeah, really interesting. I think that reminds me of a term I heard recently about information laundering. You know, you do that mediocre study, yeah. it's a news story, and now you can talk about the news study, the news study, right? Or the news story. Yeah, exactly. Because you're talking about the news exactly. story, you're not promoting your product. It's, and we see a, that we see that time and time again yeah. here, particularly in, in this industry. And and it's it's one of the problems is like in science, we don't like to talk in absolutisms, right? Mm -hmm. And that's been a, a big problem 
with COVID, you know, and discuss about COVID, you know, we, we don't want to absolutely say, well, this method works because that's, that's not how science works. Science is a debate. It's data driven and nothing's proven. It's all about falsification. And so what happens is because of that, we're susceptible to being used and abused by industries. And that's certainly the case with CBD. We're simply doing a study and understanding you yourself doing a study. It's not, you know, it's not going to change FDA practice. We're just doing an initial pilot study. Well, actually, that pilot study has real monetizable value to the industry that you're serving, a recreational industry, not a medicinal industry. All right. Well, unfortunately, uh, this, it's been great talking with you, but uh, but we're going on far too long here. So uh, I'll give you one last minute if anything else you want to add on the topic here. <laughs> well, I, I think on this topic, the answer is clear. Our study clearly shows that the public thinks CBD is a cure-all, and yep. that shouldn't be allowed. The FDA, Health and Human Services, should step forward and regulate this marketplace. I know we're focused on COVID, but some things are just as important, and CBD may be one. We're already far behind the eight ball here. We need to take action now with new regulations to govern how they're marketed, how they're researched, how they're sold, and also to reinform consumers about the dangers and how they should use real medicine to treat what ails them. Great. Well, thank you so much. Of course, if you're watching, you can get this paper and more at geminogram.com where everything is free to access. We've got new papers coming out every weekday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. And of course, join us next week, Tuesday at 3 p.m. Central Time for our next episode of JNO Live. So stay, uh, stay safe and take care. Thank you.